Good morning, everybody. We would like to welcome you to our church service this morning. My name is Flavia, and this is my wonderful husband, Gerard, and together we're part of the Northwest region of the Church of Christ. Amen. Uh, in order to prepare our hearts for the service today, I would like to read a scripture from Hebrews 12, from verse 1. It says there, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What is so encouraging about the scripture is that Jesus has already overcome. And all we need to do is fix our eyes on Jesus this morning. As we go into the service, to set aside everything that hinders and entangles and focus your eyes on Jesus as we're going to worship and as we're going to listen to the message today. Today, Tsepo May will be doing the service for us. And we'll be looking at the, the eighth installment for Anchor for My Soul on the book of Hebrews. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, pray. Dear God, uh, good morning. Um, we come before you to pray to you, Father God. I'm praying that you will open our eyes and our hearts to listen to your word. Lord, please, please be with the speaker today and uh, bless this day. We love you, Lord, and I pray all these in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ain't no rock, ain't no rock gonna stand in my place. As long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. Ain't no rock, ain't no rock, ain't no rock gonna stand in my place. As long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name.
Good morning. My name is Atepo May, and by God's grace and the grace afforded to me by our leadership team, I have an opportunity to share this message uh, this morning. So last Sunday, our message was focused uh, on the National Women's Day. I hope that the women were encouraged and um, that they were able to celebrate National Women's Day on Monday. So we've been going through the book of Hebrews over the last few weeks. We, we understand that the audience were a group of Jewish Christians who were going through a, a challenging times uh, in their Christian race and that um, they, they were tempted to go back to Judaism. The author urges them and warns them not to give up. So this morning we'll be focusing on Hebrews 6. Now, this chapter has some elements that might be controversial for some. It has some elements that, you know, are a bit difficult to understand, uh, but it also has some powerful elements that we can learn from. I pray and I hope that we will be able to grasp what we can learn from it. We're going to start reading in Hebrews 6 from verse 1 to 3. Hebrews 6, verse 1 to 3, and it reads as follows. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. Now, the author wants to get the audience ready to move on. If we, let's look at the, the phrase, elementary teachings about Christ. Now, who was the letter written to? It was written to Christians who were Jewish or had a Jewish background. We do know that Christ is a Messiah. So in a sense, you could say these were elementary teachings about the Messiah. Now, what were the elementary teachings about the Messiah? In a lot of ways, it's basically the Old Testament, which has the elementary or introductory uh, scriptures about the Messiah. It is very possible that what the writer is saying to the audience is, let us not try and go back to the Old Testament and try and live um, there anymore. But let us go on to the more mature things that we get under the new covenant. Now, this is consistent with the message that we find in the book of Hebrews, where it talks about how the Old Testament is the shadow and the new uh, covenant is the reality. How the old covenant is inferior and the new covenant is superior. Now, you might say, uh, Tepo, this looks like a Christian list. But I can tell you that we are informed that scholars have looked at this closely and all of these uh, elements are valid in Judaism. We'll continue reading in verse 4 um, of chapter 6. It says, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, who, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. So our first point this morning is spiritually alert. Now, before we get to the part that might be standing out for you, I would like us to look at other elements that the author covers. He talks about the different experiences that one goes through towards conversion. You know, as they make their way, as they make their way towards becoming Christians. And I'd like us to look at some of the elements that are highlighted in this passage. It talks about being enlightened. You know, when everything unfolds and you start to see what the prophets longed to see, 
in a sense, the light has been turned on. Things start to make more sense. You know, it talks about tasting the heavenly gifts. And the best guess here is referring to, you know, things like forgiveness. It talks about sharing in the Holy Spirit and tasting the goodness of the word of God. Uh, of, of the word of God. So the audience basically are people who had become Christians and had experienced all of this. They now wanted to leave this and go back to Judaism. Now, it is very likely that there is a difference between how the author uses the phrase fall away compared to the way that some of us might use it. There may be a difference between someone who falls away as per the author of the book of Hebrews and someone who has wandered off from the truth as described in the book of James. James 5 verse 19 says, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back. The book of, Math, of, of James says if you have someone who has wandered away from the truth, you can bring them back. It's most likely only God who will know, you know, for sure if an individual has fallen away or wandered away. You know, falling away, as described in this chapter, is a condition where the heart gets so hard that you do not want to return or to repent or be brought back. They say prevention is better than cure. My assessment is that the author has shared warnings and encouragements in earlier chapters that would help reduce the chances of the audience finding themselves in this difficult situation where their hearts could get so hard that they would not repent. And I'd like to recap on some of these. Hebrews 2 verse 1, it says, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we've had so that we do not drift away. Hebrews 3 verse 1 says, fix our thoughts on Jesus. Hebrews 3 verse 12 says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitful now what can we learn from these verses I think that one of the elements is if we are not careful we can get to a position where our hearts will not want to repent the questions for you and I this morning are are we alert to the potential spiritual dangers if we fail to heed these warnings? Are we paying the most careful attention to what we've had? Are we fixing our thoughts on Jesus? Are we encouraging one another daily? We'll continue reading in chapter 6, verse 7 to 12. It says, Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it would be banned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. 
God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you've shown him as you've helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Now, our second point is spiritual characteristics. You know, there are many similarities between spiritual and natural laws. After all, they all come from God. You know, we are like a land that takes in the word of God, his grace and all the goodness that we get from him and we produce a spiritual crop. You know, God makes us grow and blesses us if we do, if we do so. You know, after some stern warnings, the writer encourages them by saying that he is confident of better things in their case. He encourages them by expressing confidence in them not giving up and he addresses them as dear friends. He talks about how, that there are things that need to accompany salvation. You know, the good works, our good works, are not to be saved, but they are because we are saved. And it talks about how God sees all of it and will never forget it. You know, the author wants them to continue and run the race all the way to the end. You know, we cannot become lazy, dull, or sluggish, but we need to imitate. You may ask, who do we need to imitate? There are many examples. We must imitate Jesus, you know, our leader. But we also know that there are a great cloud of witnesses that have finished the spiritual race. You know, a few years back, a group of us decided to join a race. Now, leading up to that race, I had planned to get myself ready for the race. But I never actually... Uh, got started and put in the work, you know, preparing myself. The day of the race came, and this 10-kilometer race was a big struggle for me. Many times I felt like quitting, but I was surrounded by a group of friends who kept encouraging me to go on. So I kept on running. I am sure that they would have clocked better times if I wasn't in that race. You know, I slowed them down because of my lack of preparation. Now, if you are one of them and you're listening to this message, Ish, sorry for slowing you down. But I also want to say thank you very much, you know, for hanging in there with me and helping me finish. You know, now I have a medal uh, that you know, shows that I finished the race. <laughs> so thank you very much. Now, I believe that we need to evaluate where we stand spiritually. Are we producing a spiritual crop? Have we decided to show the same diligence until the very end? Are we watching out for laziness? You know, I came across this quote. At first, it may feel like freedom and fun to skimp on prayer and neglect the word. But then we pay. Shallowness, powerlessness, vulnerability to sin, preoccupation or trifles, superficial relationships, and a frightening loss of interest in worship and things of the spirit. John Piper. You know, we need to ask ourselves, are we imitating those who have inherited what has been promised? Now, the author has been focusing on the character of the audience, getting them to look at their lives, 
But that is not the whole picture. You know, when we decide on a direction that we will take uh, in our lives, it's also very important to consider the character of God. So we see the author transitioning to the character of God. In Hebrews 6, verse uh, 13 to 20, it says, and this is our third point, God's character. Hebrews 6, 13 to 20, it says, When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he saw by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the author confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because, wanted, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the, to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So we see the author getting them focused on the character of God. He's getting them focused on the promises of God. You know, the Amplified Version from verse 17 to 20, it says, In the same way, in his desire to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable nature of his purpose, intervened and guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to him for refuge would have strong encouragement and indwelling strength to hold tightly to the hope set before us. This hope, this confident assurance we have as an anchor of the soul, it cannot slip and it cannot break under whatever pressure bears upon it. A safe and steadfast hope that enters within the veil of the heavenly temple, that most holy place in which the very presence of God dwells. Where Jesus has entered in advance as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And I'll let that sink in a little bit. You know, verse 18 talks about two unchangeable things. His promise and his oath. You know, God, he, he, he didn't need to give an, 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 an oath. But in order to give extra assurance, in addition to his promise, he also made an oath. Now, what is the job of the anchor? It is to stay fixed in the seabed no matter what the conditions around it are. You know, God doesn't promise smooth seas, but a firm anchor. You and I do not know what tomorrow will bring. We do not know what storms will come. 
But we need to ask ourselves, are we holding on to God's promises? Will your anchor hold? You know, at this time, we'll take communion. And I'd like us to reflect on this. You know, in verse 19, um, the author, in a sense, he takes this anchor and he drops it in the inner sanctuary, behind the curtain, the throne of grace that we spoke about in chapter 4. And he talks about how Jesus has entered on our behalf as a high priest. You know, in one sense, you are out uh, at sea and you have this physical anchor. And in that same second sentence or second part of that sentence, you are now in the inner sanctuary um, and, and, and basically at the throne of grace. And let's pray as we reflect um, on this and as we take communion. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Father, we do pray that you do help us to move on to maturity. We pray that you help our hearts to be responsive to you, to your word and to your Holy Spirit. Please help us to grow our understanding of the hope that needs to be the anchor of our soul and also help us to understand and appreciate the throne of grace. We thank you for letting Jesus die on the cross for us. We pray that because of your grace, our lives may have things that accompany salvation. May we be people who bear fruit for you. We pray and we ask for all of these things, asking you to help us to hold on, to run this race with diligence until the very end. It is in Jesus' name that we pray and we ask. Amen.
Sipper, thank you for the message and reminding us to focus on God, His character and His promises. It is always encouraging to know that God will never change and He is the ultimate anchor. No matter what goes around us, God will always be there. I know I often have to remind myself that success does not determine how close I am to God as we will always have various challenges. The question is, do I really trust in God no matter what? Yeah, thanks again for a great message. Uh, just a few announcements for the week. Uh, we want to remind you that the equipping series, First Principles, will be from 5 to 6 every Sunday on Zoom for the next few weeks. Uh, this week we will meet in our family group slash Bible discussion groups. Uh, yeah, contact your Bible talk leader to give you the, the right date. And lastly, we'll focus on a Kidogo Global Good News Minute video. Uh, we're part of an international family of churches, and this video will focus on one of these churches. I hope you enjoyed the service, and I hope you'll join us again next week. If you are visiting and would like to connect with us, please see our details at the end. We would love to hear from you, and looking forward to seeing you again next week. Have a great day. Thanks. We are part of the International Churches of Christ. The last year and a half have been trying to say the least, but God has been at work. The International Churches of Christ grew by about 2,400, bringing our worldwide membership to just over 114,000 last year. At the beginning of this year, we had 711 churches worldwide. We are praying that by the end of the year, we will have 758, Lord willing. This includes two new nations to our fellowship, Wales and Uruguay. The Beam Missions Foundation is an organization dedicated to raising up new leaders in our fellowship of churches. They currently fund 12 schools of missions in Africa, Australia, the United States, Latin America, Europe and Eurasia, Asia Pacific, and India. In the last five years, the BMF has had 193 graduates and 177 of those graduates have served or are currently serving in the ministry worldwide. We thank God for their efforts and their fruit. There is so much good news from around the world. For more news like this, check out the other videos on our YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us on this Good News Minute, and God bless.